Across Britain, thousands of historic buildings have been neglected. Their owners are unable to restore them because of planning restrictions or lack of money. Luckily, some romantics do take on the challenge of restoring and converting these historic buildings. Poor things just stood there, neglected and sad. It is a challenge. Often, churches, mills and agricultural buildings are abandoned because they seem too big or unfit for residential conversion. I don't really mind if this lasts me the rest of my days and I would die doing this. It's extraordinary just to actually see you know, people working here. As an architect, I'm passionate about our architectural heritage. These buildings have as much history and tell as many stories about our past as any stately home or medieval castle. I love the challenge that these unusual spaces give us when we're trying to create a place called home. This time, I'm meeting an artless couple who are taking on a roofless church in the Outer Hebrides. Here, it's the weather that brings problems. You're the guy with the insulation who ruined our Christmas. Yeah, yeah. And they have to be accepted in this close-knit community. I still have the same opinion that I don't think this should be restored. It's just nasty. I mean, it's not right. <laughs> I've come to the island of Bernaray, in the centre of the Outer Hebrides, 45 miles off the coast of Western Scotland. Located in the Sound of Harris and joined to North Uist by a causeway, this remote island is only inhabited by 130 people. After three years of wrangling, artists Keith and Sheena McIntyre bought this Thomas Telford church in October 2010 for £20,000, which was on the building's at risk register. Built in 1829, the church has been derelict for the last 80 years. I think it's a beautiful island, probably because I've been around that corner many times. You see that the building is there, the feeling of it, it's got a sort of powerful vision there, you know, just on its own. Never ever thought I'd be living in it for one minute. <laughs> Originally from Edinburgh, they now live in Newcastle and work full time in education. But as artists, they're attracted by the dramatic coastline and the beautiful landscape. The couple have two sons, Casey and Lewis. With them, they plan to convert this former church into a holiday home and artist studio, where they can bring their art students and musician friends to be inspired by the amazing light and the rugged vistas. It's taken me over 12 hours to get the burn away from London, but the scenery is just breathtaking. And you can see that this Telford church was designed to be a bold statement within the landscape. I'm George, nice to meet you. Keith Mike, how are you? Nice to meet you. Hi, Hi Sheena. Sheena. How are you? Nice to meet you, I'm well. This is yeah. unbelievably beautiful, isn't it? What a location as well. We should go inside yeah, and have a look. Yeah, Come on. Sitting over 50 feet above sea level in the middle of a working sheep farm known as a croft, the church is 500 yards from the nearest road. And as it's a Grade B listed building, the exterior cannot be changed. With its footprint of 1,400 square feet and no roof, it really is a blank canvas for Keith and Sheena to work with. Beautiful, isn't it? Yeah. It's... I mean, all the detailing of the arches over the windows and everything. It's amazing it's still standing, really, when I you know, think being kind I of know. exposed I, to the I, elements. I always think that. Each time we come up, we think, oh, it's still there. <laughs> you think of you know, the, you know, the Atlantic Ocean is just over there and everything's been thrown, you know, hurricanes. And it's, it's basically the rock has stood the test of time. I mean, it is beautiful, obviously, but why have you bought something like this? It was just that immediate love affair. You, you know, quite literally, the hairs are... We never thought at that time, though, we'd, we'd well, get it, you know. It's just this little wild dream that suddenly has come to a reality. What are you going to do with this building, then? What's it going to be for you guys? What's the dream and vision for it? Sort of living space, but also working space, studio space, a space yeah. where people can meet. 
it's taken three and a half years to buy the church and get planning permission. Now they've got it, Keith and Shana will need the support of their neighbours if they're to be embraced by this very close-knit community. Many of the islanders still observe the Sabbath, so out of respect, Keith and Shana will not be doing any building work on a Sunday. So how much do you know the local community here? How much are you linked in? We are incomers. We are incomers to the island. And, and uh, it takes time to sort of build up those relationships and and uh, one's got to be sensitive to the fact, for instance, that this is a working croft, you know. We're at the height of the lambing season here just now. So, you know, you, you, there's a, it's a big learning curve for us as to what, what's, what can be done at certain times. The inheritance from the recent deaths of Keith's aunt and father just a few months ago has given them a budget of £320,000. It's, it's a great legacy to, to, to them for for helping us out. Absolutely. Well, it's a legacy to them, and uh, it's going to be a kind of built memory to them as well. Yeah, yeah. 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 it's a nice way to think of it, yeah, definitely. This restoration is a real family affair, and Sheena's brother Derek is their architect. So we've been highly respectful of the original structure, and from the outside, it's going to look very like it did when it was a church. We're going to restore the external walls, maintain them, keep all the existing window openings and door openings, mm -hmm. and then on the inside, it's going to be 21st century. The church has been designed for two uses, as a home and a place for artists to work in. The hallway leads into a double-height open-plan space, including a kitchen and dining area, and raised viewing platform to maximise the views from the windows. Also on the ground floor are a bedroom, utility room, shower room and storage. Two staircases at each end of the building will lead up to the first floor mezzanine level, which curves around the space below and has a further lounge area leading through to two further bedrooms and a large bathroom. This level faces a large skylight capturing the views of the bay. As well as help from Sheena's architect brother, Keith and Sheena's own sons will be lending a helping hand. This project is a challenge on many levels. It's physical isolation, the family living 400 miles away from the build, and the extreme weather the Atlantic throws at these remote Hebridean islands. As an architectural student, I learned a lot about the man responsible for the design of our remarkable building. Thomas Telford was known as the Colossus of Roads. He built over a thousand miles of roads and over a thousand bridges throughout the UK, rising to become the first president of the Institute of Civil Engineers in 1820. His grand feats of design and engineering can be seen at the Pont Casuste Aqueduct, the Menai Suspension Bridge, and the London to Holyhead A5 Road. However, he wasn't just a road builder. His talents extended to railways, dockyards, and canals, many of which are still in use today, nearly 200 years later. It was after Telford made his name that he was able to champion projects of passion, like those in his native Scotland. Reading more into Telford, I can see that it was his background coming from a very humble shepherding community on the Scottish borders that inspired him to give something back to his homeland. Particularly to the remote Highland Crofton communities like those here in the Outer Hebrides. Despite living and working in Newcastle for 20 years, like Telford, Keith has a real affinity with his Scottish homeland. A connection he also shared with his late father, who sadly died six months ago. Keith's still grieving, but is spurred on by his father's memory and desire to see this restoration project through. Yeah, Keith lost his dad recently, didn't he? Which has been quite, quite tough. One of the, the sort of dying wishes was that we sort of carried it on, and he hoped that it would come to fruition. And I think that's he's, he's never let that go. More than just bricks and mortar, it seems this restoration project is about keeping alive that legacy. 
he came into the property with you, didn't he? I mean, he, he did. Was part of that journey. My father was there the first time the hairs went up the back of my neck, and I said, "What? What do you think of the staff down here?" And he just said, "Yeah, go for it." So, um, so I'm starting to get bubble here. <laughs> but it's, it's really, really important. Yeah. But you know, it's um, hi. There's a bust that was made of my father when he was a child, just of his little boy. And I'm having a copy of that made. And we're going to have that placed outside just so he's looking out over the sea. It's an emotional project for Keith, which I think is why he's been so committed in reaching the point where the build can begin, three and a half years since he and Sheena first began this restoration journey. Determined to get this project going, Keith has instructed local builder Angus MacDonald to clear the ground inside the church. It's all he can do while waiting for a building warrant, which he needs before he can begin work on the main structure. The family's passion for the building and what they want to do with it is just unbelievable. But what I'm worried about is even though you can celebrate the beauty of this building in the most stunning location, what comes with that is the most brutal and tough weather and they're expecting to get this building project done within a year and even on a day like today which is supposed to be spring we've been absolutely battered just think about what it's going to be like when it gets in the winter since my first visit to the Telford church on Burnaray in April progress has been slow Keith and Sheena McIntyre have battled for three and a half years to buy and get planning permission on the church. They still haven't got a building warrant, which is what they need to start the build. 400 miles away in his studio in Newcastle, Keith is at the end of his tether. It's frustrating because the one thing I want to do very quickly is actually capture the best of the summer for actually getting a roof on the building. Um, that's our priority. To make their budget work, Keith and Sheena need the builders to take advantage of the mild weather and the long summer days. Despite living in Newcastle, Keith and Sheena want to push the project forward, so they've made the long trip to Burnaray. Until the restoration is complete, they'll be staying in rented accommodation on the occasions they visit the island. They want to press the council into issuing the building warrant. They also had to find a new main contractor as the delays have meant their original builders were forced to take other work. We now find ourselves that all these builders have now got, um, have now got big contracts that just leaves us without someone here who can do the whole package for us. Mm -hmm. Their only option now is to appoint a contractor from outside the islands. My scale rating from 1 to 10 in terms of frustration is going to go way over the mark, it's going to go right over 10. If our new builder comes out next week, he says, yep, yeah, no problem, we're ready to go, okay. let's do it. And we can't say, we're going to, I don't want to say to him, we can't do it because we've not got the building warrant. We'll just have to say we need it next week. We need it next week because we're ready to go. Being their first restoration project on a listed building, Keith and Shana perhaps have optimistic expectations about their start date. So while they struggle with their building warrant and contractors, I want to find out more about why our church was built. One of Thomas Telford's greatest engineering achievements is this, the Caledonian Canal, which stretches for 60 miles from the east coast of Scotland all the way across to the west coast. But what I'm intrigued to know is, why would an engineer for a reputation for such grand scale projects like this get involved in our humble church? To find out more, I've come to Edinburgh, to the National Records of Scotland, to meet Alan McLean, a published author on the subject. So Alan, our Telford church is in the most remote place imaginable. Why were these remote churches built up in the highlands of Scotland? Well, it was part of a policy of the government to give thanks for the victory at Waterloo and money was released in order to build churches both in big cities in England but also in Scotland and they thought that the Highlands had a particular need. After the Highland clearances, much of the population were dislocated, leaving many people and their ministers living far from their local parish church. Following four years of petitioning, in 1823, the Church of Scotland received the sum of £50,000 to build new churches. This was sanctioned by Parliament, 
believing it would civilise the Highland population who were perceived to be in need of spiritual salvation. So what I'm intrigued to know is why Thomas Telford, this eminent engineer, why did he do these modest churches? Well, I think the whole point was that he already had all the workmen and the surveyors and the craftsmen that he needed in place. So it was quite simple also to take on the commission of building these 40 churches. And what sort of man was he? Why did he feel the need to design and build these churches? Well, he was, came from a very humble background and all along he felt that the Highlands were somewhere where he wanted to give as much as he could to the community. So he was quite a humble guy, quite a compassionate man. He was certainly very compassionate and he wanted always to better his fellow human beings in any way he could and the church project exactly fitted into that. Eventually, 32 churches were commissioned and in 1825, the site on Burnery was finally chosen. Well, this shows in the sixth report of the commissioners, which was written up at the end of the um, work being done on all the churches, that indeed on the Isle of Vernera there was a church built. It was built on an elevated site, the southeast side of the island, and it shows too that uh, there were a thousand people in that vicinity who could go to church there. But interestingly enough, the commissioners in their views of the congregation said here that they were poor crofters of the lowest order, <laughs> mainly engaged in agricultural labour, and then go on to say that they were active, rude and ignorant, but willing to receive instruction. <laughs> Sounds like me. <laughs> Finally, the building warrant has come through and work on the church can start. Keats made the journey from Newcastle to oversee the critical measuring of the window frames and has had to leave Sheena at home because of her work commitments. And the first thing Keith notices is that he can drive up to the church for the first time. Oh my God, I'm building a new road. It's in. <laughs> oh, wow. The diggers are on site. It's extraordinary just to actually see, you know, people working here. Until the warren came through, Keith couldn't do anything to the structure, including work on the windows, which is what his newly appointed contractor, Jim Cook from the Isle of Skye, is keen to begin. Hi, Keith. You've arrived. We've got four or five weeks to make the new windows, so it's quite exciting. There's a bit of a sweat on to get them measured. I'll not detain you. This is the problem with being on the island when you want to bring an, an expert over who, who has That's to do work like this. You've got to actually fit in things like, you know, ferry timetables and tidal changes and the weather. They're absolutely perfect. Yeah. Very impressed. It's just a bit of weathering in the inside edge. Right. That's all it is that's making the difference in the sizes. From your perspective, it's better because the windows are all manufactured the same. The same size, yeah. Whereas if they're different, that's a it's a nightmare and more money. Because they'll have to fit the existing openings of the church, these measurements are critical. And as the church is grade B listed, they'll also have to be the same as the original Telford design. With the windows measured up, there's another problem inside the church, which Groundworks contractor Angus is trying to resolve. There's 1.3 metres down there of, of soil and gravel and stone. That's what? Was trying to break that That was stone. in this rock breaker, and it's a very effective rock breaker. That worked well, Good but God. that was literally just bouncing off some of the stone in here, just bouncing off it. And then that's a thousand quid, by the way, Keith, you know that? The other point. <laughs> we're, on third, we're on our third one now. <laughs> oh, you're, you're, yeah. you're, you're, are you joking? No, no, don't joke over things like that. <laughs> Seriously, how much do these cost? No, they're about 200 pounds. Yeah. Right. That was very funny there, <laughs> <aren't you? laughs> That whole thing about, in order to make a good omelette, you've got to break a lot of eggshells, but well, there's a hell of a lot of eggshells getting broken here. As an architect, I can see that Telford's designs for the parliamentary churches and their accompanying manses were incredibly plain and simple. His brief from the church commissioners was to develop a very standard template kit form of church design, something that was easy to maintain and could withstand the tough Scottish weather. Built from this standard pattern book and using local materials, these churches could be incredibly cheap. A budget was set of just £1,500 per church. And in the end, 32 churches were built from a parliamentary grant of just £50,000. 
You can see from the shell of the plan of Keith and Sheena's church that Telford's done exactly what was required of them. It was very much function over form. These churches didn't have any of the architectural flourishes that you'd expect to see of a building of this type of this period. To get an understanding of the simplicity in all its glory, I've come to a very similar Telford church in Plockton on the Isle of Skye. It's still in use for worship and gives an idea of how Keats Church would have looked before it closed in 1927. I'm meeting Dr William White, an expert in 19th century ecclesiastical architecture. Lovely to see you. This is fantastic to see. It's so similar to our church with its arched windows, its very strong gables and the two separate entrances. Absolutely. It's very deliberately simple, but it also reflects the underlying theology, the Calvinist ideas that mm. underpin this church building movement. Can we go inside and have Absolutely. a look? This is very different to our church because it's right in the middle of a village. Absolutely. This is a, a planned village and all it needed was a church. So we got a kit one. So here you are. That's fantastic to see. It's much lighter and brighter than I thought it would have been, actually. The whole building has been designed for one purpose, really, and that is to preach. This is the focal point of the whole thing. So all the pews are facing it. The, uh, the galleries have been built so that they get maximum view of this. And so everything is there for the minister to read the Bible and to preach. So was the simplicity purely down to the restrictive budget? Well, there is a budgetary question. This is all being built for £1,500. You don't get a lot for that. But... I think above all, there's a theological reason for the simplicity. The idea is that you're not going to be distracted by images or stained glass. The word of God is everything. Absolutely. This is, if you like, a machine for praying in. The thing is about these churches is that you can fit what you want into them. It was basically from a pattern book, but that meant you got to change features. It meant you could decide perhaps we won't have a balcony, perhaps we don't need this extra aisle. The pattern book system is actually quite good for a church with limited funds, isn't it? Because you can pick and choose just to suit your specific budget. Absolutely, and you can also, if you decide that you in the end need a gallery, then you can add one. Retrofitting the place isn't that difficult. Back on Bernoulli, and the weather is beginning to change. Thank I thought I came in on the plane, it was like that, <laughs> boom, 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 boom. I was thinking, no one's going to be building today. Yeah. But they're here. I know. They're, they're doing it. They're tough out here. Yeah. This is I great. Mean, it's amazing. Where's that from? This has come from an island which is like in that direction. There's some beautiful old barns there that were falling down. But originally, it's from Balahulish. It's great. We're, we're taking the slate from that island to put on this building. <laughs> the slate on this building went to another island. It's very yeah. ecological. I like that. It's been a couple of months since Sheena visited site, and I'm keen to see what she thinks of progress. Oh, <laughs> my <laughs> word. Oh. oh, my goodness. This is amazing. I can't believe it. I think what's incredible, now that the timber's up, and as you're drawn through this space here to what's going to be that kind of double height space, it just looks amazing. It feels like being in the, the bowels of an old ship. <laughs> <laughs> Despite Keith and Sheena not being on site all the time, so far, this restoration project is a brilliant example of how to do things the right way. They've got a really good architect and a brilliant team of builders who seem to just be able to work through anything. With any other project, in a location like this, with this sort of weather, you'd think they're not going to make it. But actually, this is such a good team and it's been so well set up. I think they might just do this. In spite of the punishing winter weather, four months into the build, our Telford church on the Hebridean island of Bernere finally has a roof for the first time in over 80 years. The contractor came up with the ingenious idea of using the internal wooden structure as a scaffold to reach the roof line. Not only to save money, but to counter the extraordinary winter storms that would have battered any external scaffolding and made the build impossible. Look forward to seeing it. Oh, it's amazing. Quite different from the last thing you hear. 
And what's extraordinary is the guys have been working in the most atrocious of conditions. I actually don't know how they've done it. They must be getting absolutely battered. Now the large new skylight is in, Keith takes me up into the roof space to look out at the view. That's brilliant, isn't it? It's good, isn't it? And you get the most beautiful view through that skylight. So as I was walking up the lane, I saw you had all the insulation here with a few tons of soil on top. Is that to keep it in place? We had the most enormous storm go through the island. What happened? Well, a lot of it started to blow away quite quickly. We actually saw some just flip up like bits of paper and, and just literally disappear right across the crofts and, and, you know, straight into the sea. So, yes, they, they, understandably, you know, members of the community have been, you know, upset with that. I was equally distressed and, and the only time I could get up here was just a few days after New Year's. We've been down on the beaches with plastic bags, picking up all the stuff, and also just going round doors, just saying, you know, Happy New Year, I'm the guy with the Kingspan, sorry. <laughs> like, uh, you're the guy with the insulation who ruined our Christmas? Yeah. Today, of the 32 parliamentary churches that were built, only 13 remain as active places of worship. In fact, Telford's church has had an incredibly short lifespan. Around 15 years after they were built, many were abandoned by their ministers and congregation because of a huge divide that happened in the Church of Scotland, known as the Disruption of 1843. This cataclysmic event ended bitter conflict within the Church of Scotland. For years, the state empowered wealthy local lairds to choose who their ministers were, leaving the congregation with no say over who preached to them. There had been tensions within the Church of Scotland for years between those supporting the government's role within the church and those championing the rights of the congregation. Feeling increasingly frustrated, the evangelists who supported the congregation drew up this document, a claim of right to claim that Jesus Christ and not the government were head of the church. The government rejected this claim in 1843 and matters reached boiling point. Ministers, some petitioned by their congregation, had become so angry with this they took faith into their own hands and walked out of the established church to form a new church, free from state interference the Free Church of Scotland. Congregations left too, and this mass exodus left the Church of Scotland with many empty buildings, and many parliamentary churches, like Keith and Sheena's, fell out of use. Back on site, the winter weather has taken a turn for the worse. Keith once again makes the long journey to site without Sheena, but has met with bad news. Once again, I come up and the first news I get is the Kingspan that has blown off the site again. I don't know why that's happened. Fortunately, I've got Casey with me this, this trip. I've driven overnight to get here. So a bit tired, a bit exhausted, and it's very upsetting seeing the mess of the croft and the island, so we, we once again have to tidy it up. It's something which I've, I've just got to take responsibility for, ultimately. But, uh, you know, we'll tidy up again. It's just so hard doing it in this wind. I've already done this once, and it was not the best of introductions to some of my neighbours. To add to Keith's troubles, there's problems with the windows. I've been told that there was some faults with the windows, and you can see them quite clearly, that there's uh, part of the sections that were just coming to bits, and, you know, we've only just installed these. You can be told when you're, like, thousands of miles away, but until you actually see it yourself, which is frustrating. It's kind of holding up the guys from finishing off the work here. Until the windows are installed, we can't actually do all the finishing work. As the client, ultimately, I'm very frustrated at the time scale it's taken. It's one of these things you want to shout really loudly at someone. Having to replace the windows at this stage of the build is a disaster. What makes it even worse is that the manufacturer is based in Scandinavia and it could be months before the new windows arrive. Clearly, there's one or two things which are are happening really fast now. When little decisions are made, which can actually have a big impact on the aesthetic of the building, if you're not here to kind of help with these decisions, it can be a bit alarming when you kind of come on site and something's different. But it is that, that issue about, again, being so, so removed from where everyone else is doing work. While Keats on the island, he wants to make amends with the island community. Neighboring crofters are angry about the insulation. 
I'm, I'm here to first, first of all introduce myself but also to apologise uh, for the mess of the insulation material that got blown about. I, I realised it was very distressing for everyone. It and, was, uh, very aye. much so. It's just blown all the way up over the hill. Aye. A lot of people that come up here, they don't realise the strength of the winds and you have to tie everything down aye. when there's a bad weather forecast. Thank you, Keith. Thank you. Bye-bye. I feel a lot happier now that I, you know, I know who he is and he has apologised. I'm still of the same opinion that I don't think this should be restored. Before I go to bed at night, I always look out the window and all you would see was the silhouette of the church and it's just beautiful and I miss that. I've got my memory of it, which is nice. Not everyone on the island is against the restoration of this important historical building. Keith's closest neighbour is John Alec McLean, a native of the island. Built to serve the people from Burneray and also those on neighbouring islands, I'd like to see how the church would have looked to worshippers approaching by boat. Obviously Keith's taken on this church and you know, your croft's not too far away, it's on its doorstep. Really. That's right, yeah, yeah. Uh, what was that church like when you were a kid? Well, it was just a, a ruin, a total ruin. As was, Keith found it? As Keith found it, yeah. That's my memory of it. But I can remember people telling me that they used to go and worship there. Oh, really? Yeah. Even people coming from other islands, boatloads of people, and they would maybe, somebody in the boat would start singing a Gaelic psalm, and they would all start singing, and the people on the shore would sing as well. That's quite so, beautiful. Actually. Yeah. Then what do you think about what Keith's doing to the church? Because you've only ever known that building as a, as a ruin, if you like, as a, a relic ruin. on that. Yes, delighted. I think it's just amazing. The first night I saw the light there, I just ran in and I said, wow, there's a light in the church. <laughs> it's back alive again. Back alive again, yeah. It's just, it's great. Even though the church lay abandoned for over 80 years until Keith and Sheena bought it, I've traced someone with a direct connection to the church and I'm dying to know if his local knowledge can shed light on its last years. Roddy, you came here as a very young, enthusiastic minister some time ago. Yes, I, I came in 1966. At that time, there was no electricity on the island and there were only passenger ferries. There were no vehicle ferries as there are today, no causeway to North Hewis. God, it must have been a really remote, disconnected place at the time. Yes, but Imagine what it was like in 1829 when the church was built, it was even more difficult. Roddy served as minister at the other church on the island, but has family connections to the Telford church going back nearly a hundred years. My grandmother's brother was the last minister of the Telford church between 1917 and 1927. That's incredible. And my, my mother, as a teenager, used to visit him, so she used to tell me about being in the church when it was used as a, as a place of worship. And what did she say to you? What was it like in that? Some of those Telford churches were inside were fairly primitive. They weren't fully floored, for example, and I suspect that the Burnery Church was, was like that. Despite its austere surroundings, at its peak, Telford's church attracted a congregation of over 200 people. So why did the church decline in terms of its population? The, the first minister, the Reverend John Bethune, um, he had a drink problem as some of the ministers oh, had at that time. Know? I think that's partly what turned the population against him. And then in 1843, something like 95% of the population of this island deserted what was then the Telford Church and joined the Free Church. 95%? Yes. Staying put after the schism in the Church of Scotland, it was the Reverend John Bethune and his drunken sermons which ultimately pushed the congregation away from the Telford Church and into the arms of the newly formed Free Church. 
The decline of the kelp industry and a potato famine didn't help. Numbers at the church dwindled, with many people fleeing the grinding poverty of the island. In 1929, the church finally closed its doors, and apart from being used as a school for the island for just a few months, the building was never ever used again. And to avoid paying any taxes on the building, the roof was completely removed and reused on a neighbouring church on another island, leaving Telford's church as a roofless ruin. One year after my first visit to the church, I get a closer look at the defective windows. They don't fit. By any stretch of the imagination, do they? It's just nasty. I mean, if it's not right, they've got to go back. Some of the mitres have started to go. The and joints on the frame. Can see it. Um, you know what the weather is like up here. It's totally unforgiving, and we just can't accept a product which, unfortunately, there are some problems. So it's a big blow for us. We're at a stage now this is really seriously holding us up because they should have been finished inside now. They could have. I really feel for Keith and Sheena. They hope to be in the building by spring, but the delay on the windows is holding up the rest of the project. The Scandinavian manufacturers took four months to deliver the first set of windows, and another lengthy delay on a replacement set could mean Keith may have to stand his builders down, just as the restoration enters another winter. On the remote island of Burnaray in the Outer Hebrides, artists Keith and Sheena McIntyre fell in love with this ruthless church five years ago. After struggling with red tape for over three and a half years, they started the build, only to be hampered by the extreme weather and defective windows from Scandinavia. Despite encouraging them to take on this project, Keith's father sadly died before the restoration began. But the inheritance has enabled Keith and Sheena to see it through. And today, they finally finished. <laughs> Someone's actually knocked at the door. Hello. How are you? Are you well? We're very well, yeah. Hello, mate. Great. Hey, how are you doing, George? Oh, my God, you're looking dapper. Look at that. <laughs> how are you? I'm good. It looks yeah. fantastic, doesn't yeah, it's it? Really, it's really come together. When you cast the mind back to when I first arrived here with no roof on, I know. no windows, walls and that, was it. that was it. There it is, restored to its former glory. And the windows are in, new ones, by the look of it. New windows. We had a long source of discussion, shall we say. <laughs> um, but the, the outcome was that the company accepted the windows were wrong size. Yeah. But it was worth actually going through all that to, to get the, the new ones because they, they look great. We're really pleased with it. This is great news, and the new windows came at no extra cost. I can't tell you how excited I am to see this after all this time. Oh, it looks amazing in there. Oh, my God. It's fantastic. Yeah, it's taking the hard way up. <laughs> oh, my God, it's brilliant. Absolutely amazing. For over 80 years, this building was a roofless ruin, open to the skies. Today, it's a sublime double height space for living in and making art. The quality of the light is incredible. The fact that you just kept everything white gives it quite a stunning minimal feel, but I don't mean minimal in a cold way. No. There's still so much character to it. You know, the fantastic roof timbers which you've painted. Mm -hmm. Yeah, even just the beautiful gables, they haven't lost any of the original character. Yeah, you still get a sense of Telford's original design still there, you still get the proportions. As well as being a creative studio space, there's also a kitchen, bedroom, bathroom and utility room on the ground floor. Can I go upstairs? Yeah, yeah. This kind of mezzanine deck was such a key part of the design, wasn't it? That beautiful curve, which kind of contrasts, doesn't it, with the kind of rectangular building. Yeah. And gives you that amazing viewpoint of your artwork at the bottom. God, you can even see all the way through the window at the end. Look at that, with the building in the background. 
In keeping with its spiritual past, the building has an ethereal quality to it, but it's supremely practical too. I love this area because it's just so simple. I mean, this chair is beautiful in itself, but to just sit up here and appreciate all of that. It's fantastic. The space feels massive. It'll be my place to work because uh, I just like this window and I like the view. So, yeah, Keith, you can't use this book. This bit's mine. <laughs> You're banned from it. That's okay, I'm downstairs. <laughs> <laughs> I know my place, I'm quite happy. So you've got bedrooms and bathrooms and everything tucked in here, which is yeah. genius because it frees up all this space, doesn't it? Mm. This church is a stunning retreat for Keith and Sheena, and because it's very much a space for the creation of large pieces of artwork, the furniture is simple and minimal. <coughs> Just lie in the bed. Yeah. You'd never get out of bed being in here. You just want to lie there all day looking at that, wouldn't you? Yeah. I'd have breakfast in bed every single day if this was my bedroom. That view is incredible. We've got another little surprise for you. Have so, you? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah. What is it? No, come and have a look. Okay. Right, so come and see how we've finished this space up now, here. This, this space was a complete surprise to everybody, wasn't yeah. it, when we yeah. discovered it? That's amazing, isn't it? My favourite one here. It's great. To get that view all the way out there, which is miles yeah. across the water. Yeah. Beautiful. And be able to look all the way down the three storeys of the space. Yeah. It's stunning. Keith and Sheena have spent all of their £320,000 budget on achieving this homely yet functional space for artists and musicians. Apart from being a really inspiring space, there's also places to relax and enjoy the amazing views. That's a nice place to stop, isn't it? Yeah. After you've been doing all that movement of going upstairs and swooping yeah. round to just nestle yourself here, it's really lovely. Perfect window here, you know, nice place to sit in the evening um, when the light's lovely. Oh. I remember standing up here when this deck had gone in, they built the mezzanine deck, the roof wasn't on, the windows went in, and I was standing in front of that window, and there was such a howling gale coming through. Yeah. You could throw your whole body weight into yeah. it, and you wouldn't even move. Yeah, it was wild. It was absolutely wild. We've had that weather again here recently, but um, the building is still you know, holding up very well. Mm -hmm. It's important to say that we've actually not done very much to the exterior, apart from mm -hmm. stabilise the building. The walls and the exterior have been, you know, it's testament to Telford's kind of engineering skills that, you know, they're, they're, they're in good nick. I, I quite like the rough and ready, weathered, slightly knackered look on the outside, and then you come inside and you've got this whole new pristine, yeah, yeah. immaculate world. I love that contrast. Look at it, the shell-like design. Yes. Very clever. And then you just flow back down to the entrance hallway and back into the original space. And there's that amazing bust of your father. That's what it's all about, isn't it? That's what you talked about from the very beginning. Yeah, it's, uh, it's good the old boy's here. It means a lot because he was in the building as well. So yeah, he did all the groundwork at the very beginning, didn't he, to make this happen? I mean, we wouldn't be here where we are now mm. um, if it wasn't for, for Keith's dad. He was the person that really got it, the whole thing up and running. Not only is this restoration project a poignant tribute to Keith's father and Thomas Telford's 187-year-old church design, it's also a stunning example of how an inspiring space for work can be an intimate family home. Here we have the fire with the doors wide open and the Hebrides out there. You've created a piece of architecture that is about your work, about your home life, about your creativity but absolutely about your family. Mm. Absolutely about your family. Keith and Sheena have invited all their friends and family to come and celebrate this incredible restoration project. Not forgetting Angus, the local builder, who was an integral part of it. Very special moment this is. Hey! First party in the house. Congratulations to a fantastic restoration project. I think as a family build with everybody involved, it's been absolutely brilliant. And I think, well, you'll agree more than anyone, that without all these guys involved, you would never have done it. Thank you to everyone. 
Here's to absent loved ones. Yep. And absent uh, contractors who also helped in the project. <laughs> <laughs> Cheers. All best. Cheers. Cheers, everyone. Cheers, everyone. To Telford Church. Yeah. I've got a little present for you. Okay. The history oh, oh. of Telford Church. Oh, great. Oh, fantastic. But not just the general history of Telford Church. Mm -hmm. More importantly, your history. Remember that day? Yes. Yes. That's my dad, my dad in the doorway there. That, that very doorway there. Yeah. We were sitting yeah. beside yeah. loved ones. Yeah. Chaps and loved ones, eh? I'm saying garlic. Fast year, copy and dry. I guess I'm a dog's gonna be imitog a year tolit year, across the day. That means uh, welcome you to uh, Bernere, and I hope you have many happy days and nights in the house. Thank you. Every once in a while, you come across a really creative and passionate family who have a deep rooted love for the building that they're restoring. This church just so happens to be in the most stunningly beautiful and magic landscape imaginable. And that's what makes this project unique. <laughs> <laughs>